all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let us pray. God, our glory, by the passion of Christ your Son, you have abolished the death which was our ancient inheritance. Form us afresh in your image, so that we who by nature are formed to bear the likeness of earth may be transformed by grace to bear the likeness of heaven in Jesus Christ, who is one with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Isaiah, beginning at the 13th verse of chapter 52. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what they have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty, that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and he was held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut down from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish we shall see his light he shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Psalm chapter 22. The response is, Be not far from me, O Lord. Be not far from me, O Lord. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are so far from my salvation, from the words of my distress. O my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. And by night also I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One 
enthroned upon the phrases of Israel. Our forebears trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They put their trust in you and were not confounded. Be not far from me, O Lord. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people, who all see me laugh, who all see me laugh me scorn. They curl their lips and they wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him deliver him, if he delights in him. But if you that took me out of the womb, and laid me safe upon my mother's breast. On you was I cast ever since I was born. You are my God, even from my mother's womb. Be not, be not far from me, for trouble is near at hand, and there is none to help. Be not far from me, O Lord. Mighty oxen come around me, the fat bulls of Bashan close in on me on every side. They gape upon me with their mouths as if were as it were a ramping and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, for my bones are out of joint. My heart becomes like wax, melting in the depths of my body. My mouth is dried up like a pot sherd. My tongue cleaves to its gums. You have laid me in the dust of death, for the hounds are all about me. The pack of evildoers close in on me. They pierce my hands and my feet, and I can count all my bones. They stand staring and looking upon me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Be not far from me, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my poor life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. Be not far from me, O Lord. I will tell you, I will tell your name to my people. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. O seed of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, O seed of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the suffering of the the poor. Neither has he hidden his face from them. But when they cried to him, he heard them. From you comes my praises in the great congregation. I will perform my vows in the presence of those that fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord shall praise him. Their hearts shall live forever. Be not far from me, O Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. How can those who sleep in the earth bow down in worship? Or those who go down to the dust kneel before him? He has saved my life for himself. My descendants shall serve him. This shall be told of the Lord for generations to come. They shall come and make known his salvation to a people yet unborn, declaring that he, the Lord, has done it. Be not far from me, O Lord. Restless with grief and fear, the abandoned turn to you in every hour of trial. Good Lord, deliver us, O God most highly, God most strong, whose wisdom is the cross of Christ. Amen. reading, (coughs) excuse me, a reading from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, beginning at the 18th verse. For the message of the cross is foolishness, foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who have been saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? 
Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased that through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. <coughs> Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Christ our Saviour, glory to you. Christ was humbler yet, even to accepting death, death on a cross. But God raised him high and gave him the name that is above all other names. Christ our Saviour, glory to you. The Lord be with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John, chapter 18, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that had been spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink? the cup that the Father has given me. So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Anas, who was the father-in-law of Calphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was one one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter And another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, 
summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king, for this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing besides her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who, was, who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. 
And again, another passage of Scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a t new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please have a seat. It's a bizarre name, Good Friday, especially when we look at it in the sense of our secular world. Most people don't understand why we call it good. A little funny quirk is I can call it good today because it's not only Good Friday, but my anniversary. <laughs> Happy anniversary, darling. <laughs> but when we think about the concept of good, it's easy to say things are good in terms of an anniversary if you have a happy marriage. But what is good? As many of you are aware, our young adults group, uh, our 18 to 35s, is called New People. And that is based on a quote by Fulton Sheen, which says that Christ came not to make us good people, he came to make us new people. So in that act of being good, what is our motivation? Some who were here last night heard my reflection of during my time feeding homeless in Newcastle about how often people would come to be good and nice people to help our community, but would not often stay because the homeless would not thank them or bend over backwards. They would get maybe a, a nod <laughs> if they were lucky. And so people would drift away because they didn't get the response that they were looking for. Because sometimes when people are good, they are hoping for something in return. Today we have a sense of good that goes beyond our understanding. A sense of good that penetrates deep within the brokenness of our humanity. A sense of good that inverts how we understand the world. Taking a symbol of humiliation a symbol of oppression, a symbol of destruction and loneliness and transforms it into the thing that gives us new life. The cross is a funny thing that we use a symbol for our faith that is the tool in which our Lord and Saviour was killed. quite the inversion. And on that inversion, we see something of what God's goodness is. I was once told a story to try and understand Good Friday, that um, if you were going to prison, 
because you had committed a crime and someone said, I'll go instead of you, that would be pretty good, wouldn't it? <laughs> that someone else will serve the disciplinary actions on your behalf. Now, is penal substitutionary atonement the only way to understand the scriptures? No, it's not. There are many different theological understandings of what is happening at Good Friday. But I also like, in the Orthodox tradition, they use a thing called Christ victorious, which is that inversion, turning society on its head. But what we do know is that in this point, Christ offers himself for the sins of the world. That Christ as the perfect and spotless lamb frees us from all that binds us to death, all that binds us to sin, all that makes us broken. Do we ever truly be good? I don't think so. Because no one can be as good as God. I once used to say a priest in his diocese, they'd ask me, how are you, Zeb? And I'd say, good. And they'd say, I wasn't asking for your moral standing. <laughs> But one thing is, is that even in the difficulty of our lives, God can fill the cracks. Um, it's a bit cliche and probably a bit overused, but it is appropriate, is uh, the Japanese art of kintsugi. And in kintsugi, you take a pot or a cup uh, that you've broken, and then you fill the cracks with a paste that's made from gold. Uh, Google it when you get home or look it up. It's quite a beautiful art. And the thing that everyone uses is that analogy for Jesus filling those cracks and making us whole. But the thing they forget to mention is, is that if you do kintsugi to a bowl or to a cup, you can't actually use it as a bowl or cup anymore. <laughs> Because when you put hot liquids in it, the, the material melts away. So there's something in that that I think we miss is that Christ takes our old brokenness and transforms it into something new through the power of the cross. That is what good is. That's the thing that gives me shivers, that even in all my failures, all my misdoings, all my bad choices that God says it's okay come to me you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest now this is all well and good but how does this cross over into our lives I think the challenge is to try and replicate that outpouring. We hear of these stories of Jesus and all these miracles and generous things and outpouring of God's goodness in people's lives. Now, I tell you what, if I was just becoming a Christian, <laughs> I'd feel a bit overwhelmed <laughs> with how do I do all this? <laughs> but it's through the power of the cross and through the outpouring of Christ that we can work towards in little steps, sometimes big, depending on how blessed you are. <laughs> Mine are usually the very little ones, <laughs> two step forwards, one step back. <laughs> but continually working towards being imitators of God. As many of you have heard, and you sound like a broken record, Ephesians 5.1, that we are called to be imitators of God, beloved children, living in love as Christ has loved us. This is not an easy thing. People say that we're good and nice people in our contemporary world. The conversations I have with people seem to indicate otherwise. Christ, in his action, transforms not just the surface layer, you know, it's not like, um, you know, a little bit of 
topsoil and then all the rest underneath is hard clay and useless, Christ turns it all into fertile, life-giving, abundant soil. You have to work with him, though. As we come to the end of our Lenten journeys, hopefully your uh, practices have brought you a little bit of turned soil, ready to plant some silver beet or lettuce, something that you can feast on, because that's what Christ is trying to do in all our lives, to transform us to be more like him. So my prayer for you this day is that when someone asks you, why do you call it Good Friday? That you might have the courage to speak of the transformative work of the power of the cross in your life. That's a challenge. (laughs) I know that I sometimes even struggle with telling people why I love Jesus so much. (laughs) And I'm the paid guy. (laughs) But if you would love to come see me and talk more about Jesus, you know I'm always here. Because I hope that by sharing together, we can share with the world. Because when the world comes to believe, then we will truly see the coming of the kingdom. And as we pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we hope for this child that was born at Christmas, this man that dies for us today, unites us in the fullness of God and in what is to come. Amen. God shows great love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us confess our sins. O Christ, we are stripped bare by your suffering. You see our dreams, our demons, and the secrets we keep even from ourselves. Forgive all that is needs to be forgiven. Heal all that needs to be healed. Awaken all the good that sleeps in us. Banish all the fears that paralyze us. Put the power of your cross into our lives forever and clothe us with hope and love. We have turned our hearts from God, our hearts to God in repentance and our sins are laid bare before the cross of Jesus Christ. In the name of the living God, your sins are forgiven. Amen. We sing our hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
First of all, let us pray for the church. May God give it peace and unity throughout the world so that we may live in tranquility and give glory to God. Almighty God and eternal God, in Christ you have revealed your glory to the whole world. To continue, we pray this work be, your, be of your mercy and keep your church faithful in its confession of your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for Peter, our bishop, that God who set him apart as shepherd of this church may keep him safe and sound. Almighty and eternal God, whose law is the foundation of all things, we pray you, in your mercy, safeguard Peter, our bishop, so that your constant care, your flock may grow and mature in faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who serve as bishops, priests and deacons, for all ministers in the church and for all the holy people of God. Almighty and eternal God, by whose spirit the body of your church is guided, governed and made holy, hear our prayer for all orders of ministry and bestow your gifts upon all your people that we may bear the fruit of your faithful service. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Elizabeth our Queen, for those who serve our nation in government, for all who make the uphold our laws, and all who serve the needs of our communities. Almighty God and eternal God, whose rule is justice, love and peace, remember we pray for you, Elizabeth our Queen, those in public office and all who support our national life, that good government and irreproachable service may draw us to live in harmony with one another. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who are preparing for baptism and all who are learning to be Christians. May God open their ears to the word, give them new life in the waters of rebirth, and number them with believers in Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty and eternal God, by whose gift the church is made fruitful with new offspring, grant to all who are preparing for baptism a deeper faith and understanding so that born again in the saving waters they may be counted among your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Christian unity, for all brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that God make, may make all of us one and keep us together in one holy church. Almighty and eternal God, whose will is that all believers be gathered and united in Christ, we beg you to look after upon the flock your son has redeemed. And as we share one baptism, draw us together in the service of one Christian faith. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Jewish people, that our God and Lord may illuminate their hearts, that they acknowledge Jesus Christ is the saviour of all people. Almighty and eternal God, who want that people be saved and come to the recognition of the truth, proportionally grant that even as the fullness of all peoples enters your church, all Israel is saved. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in Christ, that the light of the Holy Spirit may guide them into the way of salvation. Almighty God and eternal God, grant we pray that those who do not believe in Christ may find the truth by walking before you in sincerity of heart. Make your people grow in love, 
eager to receive more fully the mystery of your life and be more effective witnesses to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in God, that they may wholeheartedly seek truth and right, and so be led to God. Almighty and eternal God, who created all men and women to desire you and so to find you, to find you and so to be at peace in you, grant, we pray, that your love and care may reach those who do not acknowledge you and let the witness of believers remove all obstacles to belief so that all may rejoice in you, the one true God and creator. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, dear friends in Christ, let us pray, God the all-powerful Father, to drive our falsehood from the world, to remove the scourge of sickness and hunger, bring freedom to the oppressed, safe map passage and happy homecoming to the traveller, health to the sick and salvation to the dying. Almighty and eternal God, our comfort in grief, our strength in affliction, let the cries of those who suffer ring loud in the ears of your compassion, that all may rejoice in your saving help and experience your constant love. We make this prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Most merciful God, we commit ourselves to you and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have died in and live alive in Christ, we may come to the full vividness of eternal life and the joy of the resurrection. In Jesus Christ our Lord. is the wood of the cross where hung the saviour of the world.
This is the wood of the cross where hung the Saviour of the world. This is the wood of the cross where hung the Saviour of the world.
O Saviour of the world, by your cross and precious blood, you have redeemed us. Save us and help us, we humbly beseech you, O Lord. We stand Saviour Christ has commanded and taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood. 
leave you, but only say the word. Unless the grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit.
if while we were sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. All powerful God, you have restored us to life by the triumph, triumphant death, of, death and rising of Christ. Let your gracious work be continued and grow in us that we who share in these holy things may never cease to give you praise. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand? Let your abundant blessing, O God, be poured upon your people who have celebrated the death of your Son in the hope of the resurrection. Come to us with your forgiveness. Lift us with your consolation. Deepen your faith in our hearts and bring us to eternal redemption. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 